Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. The word transcendent is thrown around a lot. And people are always talking about how do we reach transcendence? What is transcendence? How do we get to the point where we transcend? Well, transcend what? Uh, what is it that we're trying to do by transcending? What is the state of transcendence? All of these questions come into play, come into being, and have to be addressed. How does one change the state of being engulfed in the world to being above the world, to be transcendent above the ordinary things of our daily existence? <clears throat> we deal with our emotional selves on a regular basis. And when we are overcome by emotion, we are in what can be called an emotional torpor. We can be either angry or happy or sad or depressed or lustful or livid. But all of these things are torporous. They've taken us over and we are under control of a very powerful illusory force that controls our being. Now, in our life, we go through these forces all the time. We have needs that often control our emotional self. When our needs are not satisfied, we go into a kind of turmoil because our expectations haven't been met or we're having difficulty meeting our expectations. And people go into depressions, they go into rages, they do all kinds of things because their expectations haven't been met. And this comes in conjunction with a, a lot of uh, modern psychology which tells you to feel your angst, feel your difficulty, express your difficulty, don't repress anything. Well, if you want to transcend, not only do you have to learn to repress, you have to learn to get rid of <laughs> the things that make you into uh, a torporous being. So, we have a set of priorities in our existence. We consider certain things important and certain things not important. And depending on that list of priorities, we are either <clears throat> ascending or descending in our attempt to transcend. What happens is, depending on where we set our goals and set our intentions, we either go deeper into the world or we go away from the world. And the question that we have to ask ourselves constantly is, in which direction are we going? Are we going more into illusion or are we removing ourselves from illusion? When you begin to understand the nature of our emotional self, the nature of our connection to illusion, 
you begin to understand the nature of transcendence and the nature of falling from grace, falling from a higher station. So, if we want to bring ourselves to a higher plane, we have to understand what goes on at that plane, even though we may not yet have arrived there. So, what are transcendent qualities? What's our connection to transcendent qualities? And are we comfortable in transcendent qualities? You know, some people can't handle being at peace. Some people can't handle being calm. They need a certain amount of excitement all the time uh, or, or else they feel they're not going anywhere. For these people, meditation is kind of out of the question because they can't do it because they can't bring themselves to the point that they don't need to satisfy their emotional need for excitement for action. So, we have to begin to realize that what the world calls exciting, what the world calls entertaining, what the world calls involvement are things that we have to somehow stay away from. The world is constantly trying to get you to be entertained by it. Uh, all of the media outlets that we have now, between television and newspapers and magazines and movies and theater, the world is beckoning you to become an audience. Think about that. The world is beckoning you to become an audience. And what happens to you while you are an audience? You become transfixed with whatever you're watching. Your own being becomes replaced by a screen or a page of words and it takes over your consciousness. So you surrender your consciousness so that you can be an audience. And you are constantly looking for situations that satisfy your need to be an audience. Certain people go to concerts because of the emotional experience that that concert gives them. Certain people go to movies of specific types because they're looking for specific emotional fulfillments. Some people like movies that you go and cry in because all of a sudden they're involved emotionally. Some like movies you go and laugh in because they're involved emotionally. Some people go to movies that scare them because that's how they can get involved emotionally. We have to learn as we move along that emotions are a lie. They are a reaction inside of us to external situations. And these external situations don't necessarily have anything to do with us. We'll cry about the station and the situation of somebody in a movie, but do we cry about our own station and situation? Do we cry about the torpor that we're stuck in? Or do we ignore that in order to be entertained? Do we try and take care of our own difficulties through self-medication? 
And self-medication is not just alcohol and drugs. Self-medication is going to the movies three times a week, or watching television 15 hours a day, or reading newspapers and magazines, or getting politically involved so that you don't have to be involved in your own life. I have seen in America right now politicians and people involved in politics replacing the religious aspects of their lives with the political aspects of their lives to the point where the politics become religion and they deal with their politics the way fanatical religious people deal with their religions. They become extremists and they become terrorists and we're involved in that. So you can be a religious terrorist or you can be a political terrorist. There's really no difference except the kind of torpor that appeals to you. So we have to be able to begin to recognize the torpors that we're involved in. The things that grab us and make us emotionally fervent. When we recognize those things, then we can begin to do something about them. But if we don't recognize them, then we think that it's okay. And because masses of people are involved in almost every kind of torpor you can think of, you think it's okay because so many other people are also doing it. So there must be something right about it. Well, if you want to transcend, you have to find transcendent people to be with and to spend your time with and to learn from. And they are different and rare. Transcendent people are trying to create within themselves a place of peace so that they can become a resting place for Allah's qualities, for God's qualities. And we, in order to get to that place, have to become peaceful. You can't be involved in compassion if you're angry. You can't be involved in mercy if you have overriding issues and causes that make you separate people into various groups. This one we can help, this one we can't help, this one is good, this one is bad. We have to get to the point where we see humanity as a whole not as different races, religions, nationalities. We have to see humanity as people and we have to understand that all people have the same aspirations and the same ideas as to what they want for themselves and for their families. If you've had the opportunity to live in different cultures, you find out very quickly that all of the stereotypes you had about people from other cultures aren't true. Once you can get by the veneer of the culture, you see that people are essentially alike. Mothers care for their babies. Fathers try to support their families. Simple, basic things that go on. Now, we also need to work to support our families and to take care of our children and to take care of our family life. But, besides those obligations that we have in this world, we also have an obligation to our Creator to get to know Him. And it is within the fulfillment of that obligation that transcendence occurs. In this world, there are lots of desires. However, 
All of these desires are without resolution. You can never have enough money. You can never have enough fame. Whatever it is that you're grasping for in the world, eventually you become a hoarder. And you can't get enough of that. So what we have to understand is that we have to turn from our attempt to grasp these worldly things to begin to grasp godly things. And the interesting thing about godly things is as you grasp them, you realize that you can't hold on to them. They're things that are to be given away. So we go from taking to giving. But if your desire is strong, if your mind is strong, if your torpor is strong, if your anger is strong, giving is out of the question. Taking overwhelms you. Uh, collecting overwhelms you. Hoarding overwhelms you. So when we leave this, when we leave that attitude, and go to the attitude of beginning to take things, look for things, desire things, that as you get them, automatically are given, a change occurs. If your intention is to gain mercy, think about the process. As mercy is given to you, you become merciful. As you become merciful, then you begin to give mercy. As compassion is given to you, and you become compassionate, you give compassion. And in truth, if compassion is given to you, and you don't give that compassion away, that compassion disappears because it can only be held on to by giving. Mercy can only be held on to by giving. And what do I mean by held on to? I mean it flows through you and as long as you're giving it, it stays in your being and comes out of your being simultaneously. It comes from that never-ending source of compassion and comes to you and through you. So if you want it to be in you, you have to let it go through you or else it doesn't come to you. And this is where love comes in. Love is the overriding principle that allows all of this to occur. Because of your love for the rest of God's creation, you take on God's attitude towards the rest of his creation. And his attitude towards his creation is to be merciful and to give. So you become one who gives. And the ones who are transcendent don't have to do anything other than be in your presence for you to receive from them. When you are in their presence, the peace of their presence can become your peace. Because the ones who, are, who have transcended are given the ability by the Creator to give their state to the ones in their company. And that's why people gather around those who have transcended, because they can feel it. And then they can feel the change that occurs in them. Now, after you've been with someone like that, or after you've been in a very strong meditative state where compassion and mercy have been shown to you, can you go back into the world 
and maintain that state. We don't live in monasteries anymore. We live in a world full of illusion and full of grasping and full of difficulty. So do we revert to the ordinary grasping that is in the world or can we stay in that state of peace that we knew when we were with a transcendent being, with a teacher. Can we stay in that state? In order to stay in that state, we have to develop certain qualities. When we get pushed, we don't have to push back. When we get pulled, we don't have to pull back. We are unaffected by the actions of others as to our own state of tranquility. We are no longer chained to the reactions of others by our emotional self. This is not such an easy trick because the emotional self is constantly triggered and has been triggered since we were young and to remove the spring in that trigger is a very uh, major step in our own personal progression. In the face of criticism can we remain serene? In the face of difficulty can we remain serene? In the face of all of the turmoil that goes on around us, can we remain serene? In the face of chaos enveloping us, can we remain serene? Is our connection to our Lord strong enough in those moments that those moments become pacified in us and our reaction? isn't triggered by the emotional self. There are some very simple uh, instructions given by masters that explain this in a few words. Jesus said, when you are struck in one cheek, turn the other cheek. Well, that summarizes everything I've just said in, in very few words. But people don't understand it. So because they don't understand it, we have to give these long explanations that the prophets could say in a very few words. But it takes years of trying to filter those words through our being, so that our being becomes those words. And it takes the ability to look into the face of normal conventional action and say normal conventional action is not what's normal for a true human being. Normal conventional action, it's not normal for one who resides within the qualities of Allah, who resides within the qualities of God. And if normal is what the world is looking for in me, it's not going to find it. And this is difficult, especially when you're young, especially in the workplace, especially in worldly encounters. When Shems was young, he was walking on along a body of water, and uh, his father was afraid uh, because of the way he was playing. He thought he would fall into the water, and it would be difficult. And Shems said to his father, don't worry. I'm not a chicken, I'm a duck. And what happens is, 
we all have to become ducks in a world of chickens. And it's hard for ducks in a world of chickens. Uh, Hans Christian Andersen's story about the ugly duckling, about the swan uh, who was with ducks and in its maturation process was different and strange and ostracized because of that. Uh, is an exemplar of this kind of understanding. It grew up into something more beautiful than any of them. But in its youth, its formation, it didn't understand. But we have to understand. We need to become swans. And even though we may go through being criticized by all the birds, because swans are different, we have to be able to move forward and not react to that criticism. So <clears throat> the word react is an incredibly important part of transcending. Learning to not react is a very large part of keeping our emotional self from triggering and becoming part of the equation. So, if we are in a chaotic, difficult, angry situation and we don't pull or that trigger of emotional reaction isn't pulled for us, we're different. If you're amidst, among a group of dogs and some of the dogs start barking. Well, the rest of the dogs start barking until all of the dogs start barking. So, question, are you going to be one of the barking dogs or can you turn and walk away and, in doing that, protect the integrity of your being? You see, when we fall, our integrity falls. When we fall, our dignity falls. When we fall, our true stature falls. And we've constantly got to get back up to regain it. So we have to have a certain sense of ourselves. We have to have a dignified sense of ourselves. We have to have a serene sense of ourselves. And once we begin to understand these qualities, we have to try to maintain them in our existence. Which means that we now speak in a certain way. We act in a certain way. We put on our shoes in a certain way. We go through life in a certain way. And once a disciple was asked, so what did you do when you were with the master? And his response was, I watched how he put on his shoes and his shirt. And by that he meant he watched how he acted. And from those actions, he learned how to act. We need to learn how to act. We need to understand that if we want to be in a state of transcendence, things are forbidden to us. Things that are not forbidden by way of the law, by way of the shariat, by way of the canon law, by way of the halacha, all the different religious laws, because they don't, they aren't that subtle. But if you want to become close to God, you have to become subtle. You have to become humble. You have to become self-deprecating. You can't be a blowhard. You can't be talking about yourself all the time. 
my teacher, Muhammad Rahim Bao Mahayadeen, when he was asked about his life, would say, I'm not here to talk about my history. I'm here to talk about his story. And that's the reality of the transcendent one. He talks about that which made him transcendent. He talks about where he is striving to be and what the Creator has given him to elevate him out of the swamp of this world. And how do we do it? Well, we do it through self-reflection. We do it through beginning to become to know ourselves. We do it through a constant examination of our actions and our attitudes. We do it through effort. And we all have to put in the effort to elevate ourselves. God loves effort. And we have to get to the point where we put out effort. Do, do, do you think turning the other cheek is easier than punching back? It's harder. And that's the whole part about this journey. It's a journey for the courageous. It's not a journey for the weak. And the weak look at the courage that it takes to turn the other cheek and they mock it. They say that it's a sign of weakness. And we have to begin to realize that the world sees things backwards. The world sees things in a light that isn't real. And we have to begin to see things not in the light of the world, but in the light of God's grace. And in the light of what God has offered us. And we have to partake in it. And as we partake in it, we will become satisfied by it. Because if we're looking for true satisfaction, we'll only find it in God's qualities. And if we want to stay in a state of being satisfied, we have to stay in God's qualities. Because as soon as we remove ourselves from God's qualities, we leave the area of abundance and we go into the area of grasping and needing. So if God's grace is where you want to be, there is a limitless supply of it. And all the grace that you want can come. But if you want material things, you're in the dogfight. There's not enough to go around for everybody. But in God's qualities, there's an abundance that is beyond your imagination. So we have to decide, do we want to live in abundance? Or do we want to live in grasping and striving and fighting over the morsels that exist in the world? This is our choice. And this is the choice we've been given and the choice we have to make. The person sitting still in a corner can be thinking about all the things that he needs in the world or can be thinking about how satisfied he is to be in the midst of Allah's grace. Who are we? We have to ask our question, that question over and over to that ourselves. Who are we? What satisfies us? What are we looking for? And the warning is that if you're looking for things in the world, there's never enough and you'll never be satisfied. The only place where satisfaction can come is in God's qualities. So stop looking for things where they can't be found. Stop looking for things that don't exist. Hone in on truth. Hone in on Hak reality. And may each of us 
find peace and contentment and transcendence in the qualities of Allah. Amin. Amin. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.